Okay, it's a new show, and I'm in a new place. I'm back in Palo Alto in all of its noisy suburban glory outside the windows as I record this, but that's not going to stop your enjoyment of the show, which was recorded in Atlanta and Birmingham. More on that in a minute. Let's get to it. Hi there, welcome back to the show. My name is Brendan Davis, and this is the If I Knew You Better podcast, where I like to dig into not only someone's backstory and their CV, but really find out what they think and what makes them tick as much as I can. And this week, I'm very excited to welcome back to the show my very first guest, Mr. Frederick Taylor. Fred and I, if you have not heard the first episode, which was the first uh, interview of this series, I did a little intro to kick us off. I will link that in the show notes, but if you have not yet heard that, no fear, you can dive right into this one. But Fred has quite a story, and in this one, we really get into the weeds about what he and also I think about a wide variety of topics. My show notes that I wrote for this, I'm going to kind of paraphrase this because I don't know if I could say it any better extemporaneously. Fred Taylor's entertainment career approach exemplifies the concept of long-term thinking. In this show, we dig into so many topics, the complicated legacy of Kobe Bryant, the Atlanta and Hollywood empire of Tyler Perry, the concept of Hollywood, as well as the idea of it as a place. We discuss race and class and the future of the U.S. and also China, what with what's happening given the novel coronavirus now called COVID-19. I think that sounds like an antacid, frankly. And ultimately, the big takeaway from this episode with Fred is winning by playing your own game. We really let it fly here. We are holding nothing back, and I'm going to share it all in its uncut glory coming up next. Hope you enjoy this show. Don't forget that you can find out more in the show notes. You can contact me via any of the socials. I'm pretty easy to track down. There's also a link in the show notes. Now, please enjoy this episode with Fred Taylor. Well, I'm very happy to be talking to the first guest again here in 2020 now, Mr. Frederick Taylor. Fred, how are you, sir? Pretty good, my friend, and yourself? I am very well. I consider myself very fortunate. We've been chatting offline about just, you know, friend check-in things. You were nice enough to reach out the other day and basically say, hey, buddy, I hope you're okay. What with, you know, the China situation and where are you? What's going on? And I let you know that currently safety, safely ensconced at my mom's in Birmingham, and, of course, I was going to try to see you in person in Atlanta, but uh, being the two professionals we are, we're recording in such a way that this should sound as if we're in the same room, although we're actually on Skype. I know. This is actually pretty exciting for us to be able to pull this off. It is. It is. We, we, we used all of our, all of our training. We, we, got about, yeah. we got about 60 years, 60, 70 years combined experience to pull this off. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Exactly. So we should lead a conference at Georgia State someday on um, communication. Set it up and yeah, set it up and I'll be on the plane, man. Well, speaking of new things, 2020, new year, new you, as the hackneyed cliche goes, what's new with you? What's the, what are the new things in Frederick Taylor and Tomorrow Pictures world, et cetera? Wow. Um, I got to say everything has changed. Uh mm-hmm. 2019 is over, and on so many different levels, it is completely and totally over. So it's just sort of a revamping of the brand. It's new energy, new people, new concepts, new places, new things. Um, Initially coming out of the blocks, it was uh, winning the uh, Studio City uh, Film Festival in Studio City, California, that afforded me a window of opportunity to get a meeting with uh, California Pictures in California. That allowed me the opportunity to sign with them as a distribution company. And it's helping to be a game changer. Uh, California Pictures is a company that's been around since the 1940s. It was started by Howard Hughes. 
Um, and it's a company that is fast forward thinking. Um, it's progressive. It thinks about the global market as well as the domestic market. And it thinks about the domestic progressive market uh, as, as well. So there's a lot more inclusivity that goes on at California Pictures that I found to be really appealing. Um, because one of the things I really wanted to get away from was the typical type of uh, distribution company in California where, oh, do they have amazing offices? Are they in Beverly Hills? Who do they mm-hmm. know? Right. Do they have Do they have fancy furniture? Is uh, the A-listers walking in and out of there all of the time? Are you in the mix? Right. I didn't want to be in the mix because the mix is not where it's at. You get lost and in the mix sometimes pretty easily, actually. Com- completely. There's an ATL saying, uh, it's called getting lost in the sauce. Yep. So um, I didn't want to do that. And um, I think the recent Academy Award winning film, uh, mm-hmm. Paras- Parasite, mm-hmm. has really demonstrated that the power of globalization, and this is just something I've felt very strongly about for a long time, that people have been saying to me, you're a lunatic, you're a lunatic, you're a lunatic. I mean, I walked out of Parasite, I saw it last year, and I said, this film's going to blow everybody out of their mm-hmm. shoes. Yep. And it did. And then I saw um, Renee Zellweger's performance in Judy, and I said, this is going to blow everybody out of their shoes. And then I saw Jojo Rabbit, and I said, this is going to blow everybody out of their shoes. And I'm like, that's the world I want to be in. Those are the films I want to make. Those are the people I want to rub shoulders with. And all of those films have one particular thing in common, and that's that they're either smaller independent film companies and distribution companies, or they're international. Right. And this is so much in line with your established work style, interests, your brand. Exactly. And so with the advent of technology, you know, the gap is closing between the big companies and the small companies. And as you know, we've grown up in an era where we have seen small companies take down big companies. I mean, we all remember Napster and all of these other things where these people would just come out of nowhere and they would give the system a run for its money. I'm not interested in being in the system. I'm not interested in working by their standards or their formulas or their how-to books or, you know, let's write a screenplay in 21 days or whatever the hell they always want to do that fits into a particular business model. Right. Because well, Because ultimately, I see that that business model lands people in places where they make a bunch of money, they buy a house in the hills, and then that's kind of it. And I am interested in pushing sociopolitical and geopolitical discourse. I don't want to be sitting on my sofa watching MSNBC complaining about the world. I want to be out in the world doing something about it. I love that point of view, and it's uh, it's in line with you in all the ways that I, that I know you and or your work. So I, and I, I'm, I'm really feeling that too. I, you know, I have a couple of movies on my plate now as a producer that I'm dedicated to. And meanwhile, I have this TV pilot. I might've even might've mentioned it when I was there before, but this thing that I've been writing and rewriting and I decided I turned it into an independent feature. And then I'm like, no, this is really a series and it's not about me. So I won't go into too much detail, but essentially it starts where you think it's it is sort of based in Los Angeles and it's not about entertainment although one of the supporting characters is an upcoming actor but but you think it's sort of that and then it mushrooms out and it loops in China and the world and geopolitics i mean you know it's it's a bit of a trojan horse but it, that's this thing that we'll see if i can ever get it set up but um you know there's some encouraging conversation but my point is simply that this thing it's not because I think it wouldn't be of a quality without without uh, drinking my own Kool-Aid, but because it does require some out of the box thinking on the parts of execs who would who would approve it and put it out because it challenges a lot of the conventional wisdom about, say, U.S., China, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's 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 my tangent of the show may have one more. I normally give myself one to kind of veer off a little bit. But in terms of your new deal with California pictures, what sorts of things are you looking to do with them? Do you have the already, are you basically porting your existing slate over to them? Are you seeing what might go out through them? Are you just, are you also creating new projects? I assume, but I mean, what's kind of the focus? It's literally all of the above. And that's the exciting part about it. It's the excitement of being on a team of like-minded individuals and we're all pointed in the same direction and we all see the profitability in truth. 
and in awakening and in presenting life as it really is versus this fantasy world that everybody's kind of gone sideways with recently in the business. Um, I have a slate of things that are a part of their company now. The first one being Counter History's Rock Hill, Mm -hmm. which is my award-winning documentary about a counter sit-in in in 1961 uh, as well. Um, Also, I'm having the opportunity to talk to them about a project that they have, which is about um, mid-20th century, early 20th century uh, gang violence uh, and uh, numbers running on the south side of Chicago. Okay, interesting. Which is fascinating. Um, there was a group called the Jones Boys, also known as the Jones Gang. Uh, Quincy Jones, his father was a part of this gang. Quincy, for a very short period of time in his life, was a part of this gang as well. That's what got Quincy to Seattle, was to get away from the Jones Gang. Oh, no kidding. And here's your spoiler alert. Uh, my mother's maiden name is Gloria Jones, whom my grandmother, who we always talk about, her name right. is Juanita Jones, and she was married to a guy named Robert Jones, who was a part of the numbers game on the south side of Chicago as well. Wow. So it just gets better and better and, and better. And they already so, had this. They were already right. doing this internally. And then Ex- along exactly. comes Jones. Exactly. Uh, and wow. Exactly. And they were a little bit stalled with it. And the CEO is literally, uh, his name's Steven, he literally was hanging around uh, down in my neighborhood <laughs> trying okay. to help develop this idea, realizing wow. the gravity of what he was doing. Yeah. And um, we just started talking and we really realized we had a lot in common. We were kind of thinking in the same direction and we genuinely like each other and we're comfortable with each other. And I like Steven in spite of the fact that there is a certain number of people that I'm affiliated with in Los Angeles who don't even know who he is. Yeah. And I don't, I don't care. Exactly. Because I like Steven the man. Well, the right and people are the right people, and that's, that's something you have, to, you have to learn to differentiate between who's hot completely. or who's got the... Again, you know who who has the uh, the right office, quote unquote, versus who versus who can get the work done and who you're in sync with. Completely, and that's what this is really all about. It's about being in sync. And you know, I've got a few other things. I've got another completed hour long documentary about women who box that I mm-hmm. shot in Atlanta as well which eventually I'm going to run that by them. And then I've got my other transgendered project, which I'm very interested in them being a part of. Um, it's shot, but I need to finish. And I'd like for them to be a part of the process of finishing it as, as well. And that's one of the things that's been golden about this relationship is that I've been, as you know, I've been working for a long time. I've accumulated a lot of content. And I'm now finding an outlet out there where – when I bring the content in the door, they're going to take it seriously in its evaluation. Right, right. And, you know, their ability to get behind it is going to be based on merit. And it's going to be based on the value of the project and the value of my character as someone that they want to work with and the um, the value of my company and yeah. the, other pe- uh, the other people that are um, attached and affiliated with me. As, as well. And it's it's gender balanced in this company. It's culturally balanced. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, people are represented across the board. Yeah. Uh, as, as well. You're from, like a mini UN over there. I, dude, I don't only want to work at companies that feel like the UN. Like, I, I can't work at places that are systemically biased one way or another because I just don't think it's a realistic vantage point or perspective. And that was really hammered home to me recently because I was at the Sundance Film Festival Mm -hmm. and uh, spoke on a panel and then sat in on several other panels as well. And honestly, at Sundance, from a political standpoint, I saw the good, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, let's talk about Sundance. And actually leading into that, let me, let me throw one at you that we didn't sort of prep, but I mean, this is where you live. So I, I feel confident that you'll be able to take this ball and run with it for a moment. I'm going to link our original episode Anyone who's listening to this, uh, keep listening. This is a freestanding piece, but I'm going to link, you know, your previous chat with me, of course. So that'll be in the show notes to make it easy to find. Uh, because that was really your backstory and how you became who you are today, as well as what you're working on at the time. But for the sake of just kind of setting a little bit of an expectation, 
I think you've done a pretty good job, but maybe how, how would you summarize what, when you're looking down the road, what are you, what's, what are you interested to say moving forward? Like what, what is, what is, what is your, what is your gestalt of your disposition toward the world and toward creating content? Um, the gestalt is uh, a global initiative. I have uh, left the building, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't see things anymore within these particular categories. Yeah. I, I have decided to not only live my life, which was what I've been doing on a personal level for a very long time, as someone who believes in humanity and considers themselves a humanitarian, now my work operates in that space as well. Yeah. So I'm I'm not thinking about, is this a Hollywood film? Is this marketable? Is this white or black or this or that? It's like, does this fit into the zeitgeist of the human condition? Right. Is this something that, you know, it's not about playing in Peoria as much as it is, can I play in Nairobi? Mm -hmm. You know, can I play in Bucharest, uh, Romania? Mm -hmm. Can I play mm -hmm. in Le Lima, Peru or Sao Paulo, Brazil? That's what I'm really concerned with now because I don't believe in this idea that people are biased when it comes to great moving stories. And it doesn't matter who they are or what they look like. People are interested in the human condition. And I honestly believe that the human condition is marketable and it's the job of today's filmmakers to close the gap between great filmmaking and profitability. Well, you mentioned several things about Sundance, and I know a great film is one of the things we'll, we'll discuss, but it was a pretty um, – you, you were basically off the plane when you got some pretty devastating cultural news. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, the passing of Kobe Bryant, which, you know, on the surface, you looked at it as, well, tragedy happens. Um, many famous people have died in, you know, helicopter crashes, Stevie Ray Vaughan or plane crashes, things like that. Right. But for some strange reason, this was a particular incident that has just continued to gain momentum. Mm hmm and it really gives you a serious understanding of the reach of sports and in particular basketball and that it is a global sport that affects basically every corner of the globe with China being one of the more significant territories where basketball is for some a way of life Absolutely. as well. Yeah, their and CBA and their and their you know historical love of the NBA, I'll just say it like that. Sure. But um, people have been very, very moved and polarized all at the same time about this person's passing in spite of the fact that, um, I mean, for all intents and purposes, he was infamous. And right. there were things in his past that um, we all easily can sign off on that are not ideal as far as conduct. Right becoming a young man with millions and millions of dollars. And both of you and I lived in Los Angeles at a particular time. Yep. And um, he was running amok at that time. Mm -hmm. And he had a reputation of, hey, don't get caught alone with Kobe. Don't get caught in a hotel room. <laughs> yeah. if, Co if Kobe comes up to you at the club, don't go home with I mean it was that type yeah. of, he had that type of- um, It was kind of the Weinstein vibe yeah, in the film it, it, industry. It, 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 it was. And Which it was is shocking to people who don't track yeah. this. But I mean, it, if you're in an entertainment, wider yeah. entertainment world, it was not uh, it was it was not a secret that uh, there were some problematic aspects exactly. of his uh, of it, his it, joie de vie or how the French say it, you know, exactly. So when it all went down, all of us on the inside were not shocked. We're not surprised. Um I was more amazed by the outcome of all of the things involving the court case and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And then he was able to scrub a lot of that moving forward. Yeah. And, you know, by the time he met with his unfortunate demise, he was looked upon as someone who was a devoted husband right, exactly. and father. Exactly. Which is, which is miraculous. And it also directly parallels how the media has evolved over the past 10 years mm -hmm. in this world. I mean, we call it fake news, but I like to just kind of consider it more sleight of hand mm. news. Okay. You know, the, the social media, things like that. 
they're magic tricks. Right. You know, right. you can you can get people to see things that are not there or are there, depending on how good you are at it. And he was a skilled craftsman. I mean, this guy walked away with an Oscar the moment he stepped off the basketball court. Right, right. That was a phenomenal uh, achievement in and of itself uh, as well. And so now you've got people like Gail King who are really trying to – you know, shed light on the fact that, you know, he victimized someone. And then you've got other people on the other side of the fence, like Snoop Dogg and Mm -hmm. 50 Cent, who are, you know, you know, as they like to say in the urban world, dragging Gail. Right, right. Because she is, you know, opening up Pandora's box and she's letting out all of these things that people want to just go away. And so- there's this push pull now for what is our level of responsibility based on you know uh profitability you mm-hmm, know mm-hmm. Kobe, Kobe's a brand he's a guy that's worth over 300 million dollars and so when you have a lot of money people want to say okay all is forgiven you know and um I don't know where that's going to land and this particular war which the battle lines are being drawn specifically between um a lot of black men and a lot of black women who yeah. are all affluent all, yeah. you know all yeah. all yeah. all do all doing well you know and they're fighting about this and they're fighting about this publicly and they're fighting about this publicly on social media. It's another you know? it's another subset of yeah. the culture wars. It's just another one com- of those com- completely. one of those d- d- uh, dynamics that people are right. playing tennis across. Completely. And here is a black cultural war that is dragging everybody else with them to the bottom of the ocean. Like we're all we're all paying attention to this. We're all watching this. We all know who Snoop Dogg is and we all care about Gail King, you yeah. know, and we all have conveniently forgot that Snoop beat a uh, homicide assault charge back in the 90s as well. You know, he was either a the trigger man for a particular incident or he was the guy driving the vehicle. But in any particular case, he found a way to wiggle out of it, and you know, Fifty Cent was famous as the guy who got seven, shot yeah. seven times. You know, so these are the people that are giving Gail a hard time, right? You know, right to the to the point where Oprah is saying Gail's in tears and all this other stuff, wow. and you know, so it's 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 crazy, and any it's the Trumpian universe, and anything goes. Well, and 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 this is a question that you know me being derived from like uh, you know white Irish roots ask you not derived from those roots because you have a different perspective than I do in terms of the cultural right. you know themes that you're swimming in. What? How do you? I mean, you 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 just explicated both sides of this very very even handedly, and and of course you're a mature man, so you can consider you know multiple points of view at one time but how, how do you reconcile all of this those those opposing forces are you are you sort of i mean you love the player but of course you know hate the hate the hate hate, hate the crime <laughs> so exactly. you know so uh how, do you do you have a little bit of a detachment from you know you don't you clearly aren't sort of in, in either camp you see both sides of this it seems and that's the point um yeah. I'm not in either camp, and there really isn't a side to choose. The world we live in now, there isn't a space for us. You know, we don't have a third party, so we got to vote Democrat or Republican, even though most of us would say, eh, I don't know about either party, right. but that's what it is, and we have to figure out a way to deal with it. And then you have people that live their lives like yourself and myself who you know, you know, you're white, I know I'm black, but at the same time, we don't live systemically in those universes, we operate in this higher mm-hmm. thinking universe mm-hmm. that transcends all of that. Well, we're very and fortunate so, to work in a, right. in a world where they, they ultimately care about the ideas and your ability to execute and deliver. I, and I, that's I, what that's what's important. It's the, 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 the color of the package or the shape of the package is not nearly as important. The, sh- the, shape, the shape is not unimportant. <laughs> Ex- but exactly. uh, but but the color of the package is not nearly as important as what's in it. Exactly. And, you know, Gail is a journalist and has the right to be able to go after any particular story that she wishes and she shouldn't be censored by anybody. 
white, black, blue, yeah. green, purple, or whatever. And I do think that money and power and influence is intoxicating. Yeah. Um, if I had beaten a murder charge in the nineties, I wouldn't say anything to anybody about anything ever. Right. You know, right. Uh, you know, but he feels emboldened, he feels empowered and he feels like he can say that. And not only personally, like give her a phone call, I'm going to get on social media with millions of followers and I'm going to say these things and make a video and put it on Instagram. Right. Which is, which is not in his best interest because yeah. once you, pu once you push send, you cannot get it back. <laughs> And it'll be interesting to see how people react to that moving forward. Is he going to do more commercials with Martha Stewart or not? Or is that going to be over? Mm. Who knows? Yeah. We'll find out. Yeah. Well, you mentioned um, you mentioned that you were on a panel and, 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 right. and, and around some panels uh, as well. What were some of the things that you were engaging on or that you really enjoyed uh, getting to fly on the wallet at? culture um specifically uh pointed towards cannabis mm -hmm. this this relationship that the industry has with cannabis and this portrayal of cannabis use in movies and television okay and um currently cannabis has a bad rap that cannabis users are bad people they smoke pot and they do bad things or they're lazy or they're indigents and things like that versus people aren't writing screenplays about someone suffering in pain who right. uses ca cannabis as a sedative um we live in a world where you know a sophisticated james bond can order a martini shaken not stirred and we still think he's a hero but what if james bond said you know let's twist one up Let's twist one up. <laughs> you know, I just then, dated myself with that, uh, that you, language. You did. But people, but you got it. Exactly. Got it. E exactly. So the, the point is, is just that then suddenly all of his credibility as a character is undermined. Yeah. Why is that? You know, and this leads back into a lot of, once again, cultural discourse that requires new thinking and higher thinking. So there isn't really an answer to any of this stuff. You just have to make the decision for yourself. You just have to make the move. It's like for yourself, I'm going to China. I don't care what anybody else yeah. says. This is what I'm going to do. I feel like this is going to work out for me sometime in the future. Mm -hmm. And guess guess what? It is. Yeah. It's it's going to work out for you. You know that. Yeah. You can you can feel that inside of yourself. Um, trust your instincts, and you'll never be wrong. That is something that a very old Japanese man uh, told me once. Mm -hmm. He's one of my mentors as mm -hmm. as well. Um, these are all of the things that are out there for us to be able to um, unpack. And that's a big part of what the panel was about, was unpacking this as um, subject matter and unpacking culture in a different uh, venue. And for me being on the panel, I was African-American, and then there was uh, a white American male who was a doctor, and then a woman who was a marketing specialist, and then another filmmaker who was Indian-American. Those are the kind of panels I want to be on. Oh, totally. The, totally. Yeah, they, they, because we're going to come in with a lot of different points of light to be able to generate or gestate some level of higher thinking. I don't have to have the answers right away. I just want to be working with people who are in search of those answers. Well, actually, let's um, just just as sort of a reference, I'm curious because honestly, and and you know, you can be as forthcoming or not as you wish. But I mean, I don't even think of you as a uh, so-called cannabis guy to use the appropriate nomenclature. So right. I don't, I, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, having known you, you know, uh, you know, quite a while, quite a while. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, I was telling my mom, I'll get back to the point, but it's funny because we were chatting on before we started here. And she says, you know, she was asking me how I know you. And I said, actually, Fred was in grad school and he was actually, I mean, I knew you from Small World Atlanta and music film circles a little bit, like we'd been in the same room a few times. Right. But then I got to know you when you were my teacher. You were like a graduate teaching assistant for one of my film classes. And I know when I graduated. So we've known each other basically 30 years, yes. which is kind of crazy and cool. Um, but my point is, in the 30 odd years I've known you, I haven't necessarily, like, I, I wouldn't have a hot take about your interest or involvement at all in, you know, kind of the world of weed. It's uh it's something that's evolved. Um, a part of that influence has been uh, living in California for a certain amount of time as well. And, you know, 
being around during the decriminalization of marijuana. Which I voted for at the state level. That was an exciting day. Absolutely. Um, And then understanding its medicinal properties and Mm -hmm. how it it can really help people. Right. Um, And that's what's made me an advocate of it. Because before that, it was always, you know, it was a party drug, to be perfectly honest. And you know, you didn't necessarily always get high quality. You didn't know where you were getting no, it. No, you, you did know, not. You know, Sometimes you, you got oregano, right. depending on where you bought it. Ex- ex- which is an old joke, again, that yeah. references you. and, and <laughs> the Carbon you know, carbon dates us both. So. Carbon dates us both. Ex- exactly. <laughs> Remember when you would get weed with seeds in it? Oh, God. Yeah. Exactly. That, and try that, to grow them, and then that doesn't work. And try work, to grow them, yeah. and that doesn't work. And, you know, I had friends that would try to crush it up and then smoke yeah. the seeds. <laughs> yeah. and all that does all, is give you a really bad sore throat. Exactly, um, but now we've evolved into a different place with the uh, uh, with the um, controlled. Exactly, substance. exactly. It can be measured, quantified, and you can go into any dispensary in California or other places where there are legal shops or dispensaries, and and depending on you know, and you have knowledgeable people. You know, usually you have knowledgeable right. people who oh, you want this for sort of a cerebral creativity you know, energetic mode, or do you want this for a sedative or somewhere in between, or do you need like just strictly medicinal or like no psychoactive properties and give it to your kid or your dog. And it's just a CBD product and you have all that. And how, how strong do you want it? You, you could choose the rainbow of flavors for that. So, Mm -hmm. and it's become more standardized. I mean, I think what I'm concerned about is the inevitable, which is it's underway. It's been underway with the inevitable, um, take over by big pharma of, of, you know, where you get your, you, you get your pack of Marlboro, Marlboro greens, a different kind of Marlboro green at the store or whatever, you know, and it's, uh, not, not to make this con- this podcast about that, but I, I had to take the opportunity to ask you having been a lifelong fan and, you know, and again, I, in China, I definitely don't touch it. I respect the laws of the country in which I'm currently, you know, breathing air, uh, and haven't even touched it since I've been back, frankly. Even though I was in Cal, I started this trip in California. I'm about to go back, uh, and and I, I will be touching it when I get back to California. <laughs> I will be touching it frequently. But I, um, anyway, that's a little too much about me. It's a bit of an overshare. Yes. Let's talk about movies, Fred. <laughs> I'm going to yes. dig myself out of this hole. <laughs> you were at Sundance. I assume you saw some movies. I did. Um, I saw a fabulous movie, an amazing movie. I, the two profound things that happened. I had a t- an, an opportunity to tour. The New Frontier exhibit, which How was, was that? it was awesome. Um, I am a big hologram VR fan. I believe in it. I believe it's the next uh, platform for storytelling and instructional media and all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's going to take a special type of storyteller to be able to handle the medium. It's going to weed out a lot of the uh, the knuckleheads. The, the people yep. that are there for profit. It's it's not a really good platform if you're only looking for profit. Right. It's a it's a really great platform if you have legitimate subject matter mm-hmm. to to share. Um, and it's it's wonderful and it's beautiful. And the uh, the other thing that I experienced that was awesome. I saw a film, and I, I saw a film that was uh, produced in Spain uh, by a filmmaker by the name of Pablo Larín, and it's called Emma. And it is, in my opinion, from my vantage point as a man, the most arresting feminist film I've ever seen in my entire life. Wow. It is the it is a feminist anti-hero film. It's basically a film where the female character is doing everything that we normally see men do. Mm-hmm. Um and it ends in a way that you could probably liken it to some type of uh, almost like an Asian horror film. Okay. You know, this particular sociopathic character gets their way. Okay. Okay. Gets their way. And in the end, um, and just takes a blowtorch to everyone's life. Uh, like psychological horror, body psych- horror, all of that? or Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And um, a level of sexuality that just gets you out of your shoes. Mm. Um, I was, I went with two other producers. One producer was from New York. One producer was from LA. We were all just 
blown away. Yeah. The, pr- the producer from New York leans over and whispers to me. She said, I may have to go downstairs to the bathroom and take care of myself. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Because this pretty hot, is huh? this it was this is one of the most erotic films I've seen in in decades. Um and you know, like I back in the day will date ourselves again. I thought, you know, fatal attraction, that's a really yeah, yeah. an erotic erotic thriller. That's like Sesame Street compared okay. to compared to this film. And then it has dancing and the soundtrack's amazing, and it's just an arresting piece of art. Yeah. And again, it's a film that is not in English. Just mm-hmm. like Par- Parasite yeah. is not in English. That was such and an amazing. I, yeah, we're we're I'm releasing this this week and of course the Oscars were, you know, right. uh, t- two night two nights ago and like, wow, oh, what a right. what a also, I think the best show I've seen in years in that narrative has been in the public too. But I thought the show is so entertaining and well produced. And then, and then especially seeing Parasites wins as well as some of the other ones that right. was really gratifying. But, but in terms of the content, I mean, do you think Emma could have a similar path? Do you think it has the same potential for a mainstream, or is the erotic aspect of it maybe going to limit it to a more of a select? I, I I say art house and you know what I mean kind of thing. Yeah. Do you think it'll limit it to more of that kind of a specialty audience? I hope not. I I hope that somehow it has the ability to break out. Um, and that is very possible. But America is a very prudish place, mm-hmm. and at times a very um gender bias and culturally biased place as well. So I'm not quite sure how people will react to it. Mm-hmm. I think the the thing that made Parasite get over the top was the fact that it was this passion play about geopolitical, sociopolitical hierarchy. Right. And it's it's something that we all it's in super America relatable. can relate to. Or super relatable when the help takes over. Yeah. And yeah. that's something that we can really sink our teeth into. And we like those divisions of caste in our society here, mm-hmm. they they appeal to us. Um, sexuality, especially a woman with a lot of power in sexuality. Yeah, that's like a third rail issue. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not quite sure how that's going to work or how that's going to go, but it could. Um, yeah. I want it to. I, I would love for it to, it to become a runaway hit, the same as Parasite. And I want to see more films that are not in English do well in America. It has inspired me to say, you know, maybe I'm going to make a film that's not in English. I've I've really started to toy with that because I want the bigger audience. I'm on this sort of global initiative train and I want to reach those audiences because I'm getting exhausted and tired of trying to please people in America to say, hey, I'm okay. You should pay attention to what I'm doing here. You know, hey, this film about civil rights is really important. Hey, this film about women who box is really important. Hey, this film about transgender children is really important. American audiences, in many instances, are just sort of DOA. Yeah. Like, they just they just don't even know what they're looking at anymore. They don't know how to appreciate anything. They don't have any idea of what real culture is. And they think that they're cool and hip because they listened to hip hop in the 90s. And I just... <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, and again, this is where we probably have a few... I mean, I think our audience is probably mostly in a in a compatible perspective, even if not exactly right. the same ones, but right. this is where we do have a little bit of our entertainment class privilege that we're showing, but, it uh, is. you know, freely, but we freely admit it. I'm just, I mean, you know, this, I'm just saying it for the sake of the audience, not thinking we're too high on ourselves, but, but, um, but definitely, definitely agree. And, 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 and it strikes me, you know, I'm, I, I have my long-term interests in China as well, but I mean, I'm, I'm, all of my developments offshore, my next projects in Paris, my movie after that's in New Zealand. The one after that is in New Zealand. My TV show would shoot in LA if I can get that going. And so I'm looking to actually, I mean, I'm moving my residence as soon as I can go back and pack my apartment. I had to get out of Dodge really fast to get ahead of the coronavirus. But um, my, my point is simply that being back here has been such a massive culture shock. It's always a reverse culture shock to come back having right. lived abroad so long and then also traveling other places and spending, you know, sure. a, a month in Paris or a month in New Zealand and 
as much as that's exotic at the time, it also becomes familiar. And then you go back to your previous normal and it's like, it just feels stale. And, and it, it's flat. It's, yeah. it's too, it's, it's two dimensional. I mean, the last time we talked, um, I had just gotten back from Sao Paulo. That's right. And, that's right. And, and that's Geneva. a pretty, that's a, Sao Paulo is, Sao Paulo is a pretty exciting place. And then Geneva is a whole other thing. I, I don't want to leave, dude. Like, yeah. I want to go. I want to go shoot there. I want to go do things there. I want to go hang out and absorb culture in Europe. And coming back here is a complete and total letdown. And I just flatlined in um, November, December. Yeah. I just, I kind of had it. I just kind of really bottomed out, and I just really started like brooming people in the industry that were still doing the same things they were doing in the 90s mm -hmm. and in the early 2000s I'm done. Yeah. Like, I just I can't take it anymore and I'm and I'm tired of listening to them as the standard bearers and this is the way it's done and this is the way it's always been or whatever. And I said I'm not really interested in that. I don't yeah. I don't I don't care. I don't think it's relevant. To me it's the equivalent of going from silent pictures to talkies. Yeah. You know, yeah. once once sound came into film, it's like we're not making silent films anymore. And now that we have gotten to this point 20 years into the new millennium, we now have a completely different discourse in how we communicate and how we talk about things and what is important. It is obvious what is important and we need to be moving towards it and I don't want to recycle things. I don't want to see the re the um uh, the reboot of Top Gun or right. any any of this other stuff. I don't care that Tom Cruise doesn't age and that's supposed to be a good thing. <laughs> I think Tom Cruise would actually be way more interesting if he was actually aging. Yeah. You know, so I-, I Might I, have to undo um, the blood sacrifice though. I don't know how that whatever, works. Whatever, I don't know if he whatever, kept his receipt or how that works. I know. That is, um, that's going to end spectacularly. <laughs> 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 that's funny i am uh you you make me laugh uh more than more than a little loudly with that yeah it's uh, the 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 perspective i mean i know why i think that is let's actually use a little bit of that higher education here um i'm gonna ask you why you think that is i mean my uh, i mean the it's kind of the trope that people and i understand it being back here people are so like most people, average folks who are not in this industry are justifiably so freaked out about what's happening in our country and the society. And it, regardless right. of which side or what, you know, a side you're on. But I mean, why do you think that is? I mean, I, I think that's why people, I mean, there's also the general lack of arts education that breeds people who can't tell, you know, uh, well, Billy they, Ray well, Cyrus from Lil Nas, but. Well, they well, this has all been feeding into this yeah. since we were growing up as kids. We knew the world was jacked when we were growing up. We knew that there was two choices. It was Lady or the Tiger, door number one or door number two. We just were fortunate enough to pick the right door. I mean, how many people did you grow up with that chose the wrong path and now they've hit midlife and they're unhappy? Yeah. You know, yeah. and they look, most, they look at... Yeah, I know that's rhetorical, but I'll actually answer it and say, uh, yeah. most of the people who I haven't talked to in 15, 20 years, but who found me on Facebook. <laughs> Absolutely. Exact, exact, same thing. Absolutely. And they look at my life and they're like, wow. That looks so that great. You, and I'm so exactly. happy. Okay, well, let me show you my 80, 90 hour work weeks. and Exactly. You know. And, my, and my, my commitment to getting out of the box yeah. and this I, idea of being open to other people, other cultures, being respectful, not thinking that, you know, I am the center of the universe and all of that. And so that's why these people are scared. They're frightened because their paradigm is breaking down. Right. The, re the reason that we're not scared is because our paradigm is coming into view. Our, my paradigm is change. Exactly. And so that's on them. You know, that's a little and, bit of a fortune cookie, but I'm gonna, but I'm not gonna walk it back. So, <laughs> no, but that's actually that's actually fun. That should be unfortunate. You should have your own fortune. Cookie. <laughs> Thank you. you. Should have a, well, a that'll, be, that'll be number one. That'll be the, no. That's actually a, that's a great idea for you as a side wow. business over that. I, yeah. uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna make a note here after the show. We yeah. have to talk about this. You could remarket <laughs> that and and start with all of these people that are on your Facebook page. <laughs> 
<laughs> that are that are that are envious of you. Yeah, well, I could start with the 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 people with the asymmetrical haircuts and the live, love, laugh photo on their uh, homepage. Yeah, e- exactly. You know, and all of these people that say things like "oh, gratitude" and yeah. all this other stuff, but they're not doing anything about it. Yeah, and then they're behind their little keyboards, pissing and moaning mm-hmm. about the world and all of these issues and all of these problems, and they're living in denial about the climate. You know, and then they're trying to be, have a revisionist attitude about eight years of Obama. You know, they're trying to look the other way with the current administration and say that this is not a train that's never going to come off the tracks. If it's not already off the tracks, yeah. I'm not I'm not quite sure Yeah. Uh, as well. And, you know, anybody that sits here and says like, oh, I don't pay attention to the news. I'm not interested in current events, world events, or whatever. I'm ignoring Oh, I it. have no time. I, 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 have, I, I have no one. No one pays attention to my Twitter, yeah. but I, I actually uh, I, I had a certain point the other day where I just had to put myself on record to the universe and essentially said, you know, pardon the profanity, but look, fuck the undecideds. If you yeah. have your head in the ground or if you're, if you're so ignorant, or willingly uninformed that you don't at least have a, an opinion about how you feel, even yeah, if you think exactly. Trump is the greatest thing since sliced, very white, bland bread. Uh, right. Okay. But at least you know how you feel and hopefully you can right. back it up with exactly. why you feel that way. But by the way, and then we can right, talk right, about exactly. it. May not agree, but we can talk about it. But, but the idea that you have no idea who you support or who you think about, mm-hmm. you know, who, I mean, or, or that you can't value rank, say, the different candidates on the Democratic side about, okay, well, I like this about this person and don't like this, blah, 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 blah. But, but it's, but again, I'm, again, I'm coming at this as a fascinated outsider. I mean, I feel yeah. like I'm a visitor in my own country, you know? Oh, you, you, you are. Um, and we right now live in a society that would systemically go down the toilet if every black professional athlete in America boycotted. Mm-hmm. What do you think would happen to us if all of the black football players had walked out of the stadium in Miami during the Super Bowl, you know, during the anthem, you know, in yeah. solidarity, yeah. saying that, well, that we will not perform for you until we are treated with equal merit huh. in America. Somebody should game somebody should game that out actually figure out the math and how it I mean I think that's a great idea to I mean like you know there was the great documentary a day without a mexican. Yeah. You know, somebody should do a version of that. Agreed. For black entertain like, uh, black uh, black athletes. Uh, exactly. And it's one of the things within my own community that we argue about all the time. And I, you know, I say to black people consistently, we have a lot more power than we realize. And power is something that it's never really powerful until you're willing to give it up. Mm. Until you're, that's when you really see the impact of who you are, what you are, and your surroundings. Yeah. And, and right now, you know, black people are addicted to power and money and influence and all and access and all of those things because it's so incredibly new. Well, so are so and, are Chinese people. That's why the, the, the what yes. you're saying about yes. black people in the state. It, it's I I absolutely my understanding again as a as a as an ally as an as a next door ally, um, having grown up in Atlanta and such and having so many friends from all over the place, but. That's what I see. So, so some of the th- some of the trends and things that seem to mystify so many commentators about the rise of China's, you know, so called middle class. Their middle class is what we would think of as like upper, upper, upper middle, uh, which yeah. is a whole other topic. But the you know, you, you, to be middle class in China requires a level of wealth that when, when you typically would have the family it's like, oh, that man, the the dad is a successful surgeon and the wife had a high end professional career and they have nannies. I mean, that's like middle class quote unquote in China. So so this idea of nouveau riche, you know, along along with that, with not knowing how to be responsible, come the same cultural issues as uh <laughs> there's a there's a very you'll you'll appreciate this old Southernism, uh uh a lack of home training. Wow. Wow. You know, I just just don't know how to and it's not men as a People use it as a judgment. I don't sit high and mighty to use it as a judgment. I'm simply saying the idea that you haven't grown up because something's so new and it's accelerating so fast, 
you just don't have any framework. You don't have a paradigm within which to no. grow and blossom in a healthy, directed way. It's just it's it's Kobe and it's Kobe as a millionaire teenager. Exactly. You know? Ex- exactly. And you're willing to look the other way on aberrant behavior. But yeah. if, you know, he was uh, Kobe Bryant, the bus driver. Right. Different story. Exactly. You know? That'd be a whole different conversation. Different story, so some, some lady from Van Nuys would be writing a report and he'd be talking to the supervisor. <laughs> Exactly. It would be over. It'd be over in a hurry. <laughs> well, you know. Well, part of why I love doing this. I mean, I remember talking to you before I even had a title for this show, actually, and just saying I was going to do it because at the time it was before an upcoming U.S. trip, and so we had some time to plan and talk about it. And and I knew I wanted you on early, and 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 when I came up with the idea of the title, if I knew you better. I mean, I really do want to get into these kind of more meaningful conversations. I don't want it to just be a bio resume update. And so that's part of why I especially enjoy talking with you, because not only, you know, can you go there? I mean, you are there. <laughs> that, that's where you're living. And, and, and so it's just about opening up the mic and letting you letting you rip and having the chat. What I, I know from our our pregame and just staying in touch in general that you you speaking of evolving and moving and changing and shifting and growing you've got yet another move of sorts well and not of sorts you have another move coming up what's uh what's next on the horizon for you believe it or not it's probably officially the craziest thing to date uh because i have a feeling i'm going to do something even crazier in the future <laughs> i i I, I, I have no doubt i have confidence in this <laughs> So I may end up in China. Is what the wow, next okay. Well, I'll, I'll, but, I'll help you find your way around. Uh, there you go. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to uh, pitch a tent in Nashville. Mm. I am going to change the conversation and the discourse of my career. Um, and it's going to delight some and confuse others. But it feels really comfortable. Um, I grew up in the music business. I grew up with a father that was very much involved in the music business. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that my father taught me that is really stuck with me is that where the music business goes, film and television is always soon to follow. Completely. And I really, really, really do believe that. And anybody that works in the entertainment business that doesn't believe that, they can go bleep themselves. <laughs> I, I'm not interested in their opinion. It's it's tried and true. It's yeah. been there from the beginning. Um, and Nashville is a place of convergence. Right. And it's a convergence of art forms, whether you're talking about the obvious low-hanging fruit, which is the country music. Sure, sure. Which is the bass. And then from there, it branches out into the alternative scene. Right. Jack White, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, Americana stuff. uh, Americana stuff, Black Keys. And then it reaches back into Memphis with soul. Mm -hmm. It reaches back into Atlanta with hip hop. And then you have these things that are just sort of these bizarre exploding supernovas like Lil Nas X and Billy Ray Cyrus. Right, right. You know, and so as much as we can all walk around and say, oh, I hate that song. I'm so tired of that song. I don't want to hear that song anymore. That song oh, has sold more units yeah. than anything on the planet. Probably since White Christmas or something. Uh, something, probably something pretty close yeah, to that. Yeah, probably and in that it, ballpark. And it's, yeah, and its reach has reached Asia. Yeah, I don't, my feeling is like, I don't like that song, but I love that it exists. Me too, exactly, and that's a part of our business. That's yeah. what we do. I, We're not I look at that as a, as a piece of col- as a too. cultural artifact in a piece of business, Com- and, and what it represents because it, yeah, the cultural impact. But yeah. you know, the commercial impact just tells us what kind of cultural impact it had, and that tells me Absol- that that I mean, I look as much as as much as any good old boy can kind of, you know, open his heart to the to the the other side of the coin, pretty much because mm-hmm. it is basically a, yeah. a dichotomy. And vice versa, as much yeah. as much as as much as the as the hip hop guy can realize that some of the good old boys are actually like on their side, they just don't know it. <laughs> and, exactly. You know, they, there's a lot more. I mean, maybe maybe the maybe the costume is different, but the actual core has a lot more in common than they would ever know. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. And as you know, having a, you're someone that is an aficionado of Southern history. Once you start going back on the timeline. Those universes coexisted. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. And hell, just not even in the South. I mean, Jimi Hendrix, and he was an outlier in many, many ways, being like an alien level talent. The fact that he was in the form of like a skinny, freaked out black kid from Seattle who went to London and became a rock star. (laughs) I mean, you know, there are all kinds of examples we could throw at it. But but those crossover genre exploding convention exploding yeah. examples are we we need more and more of those and and people do you know people who have other issues people who have a more direct you know they're they're look their heads are down or they're looking at something else essentially mm-hmm. or they just don't have the you know the the sort of framework we have because this is our our world you know some you know some people miss it but again uh you know little nas billy ray cyrus managed to blow the hell up you exactly know? and and they've created a portal. And now what other content is going to move through that same portal? Yeah. You know, and I want to be someone. Maybe something who good. A- <laughs> Sorry. Well, yeah, That's pretty judgy. Yeah. That's my personal well, taste. But I know. That was good, though. That was very sweeping. That was a... Uh- <laughs> That was a, that was a drive by. That, yeah. that was really good. <laughs> Rat a tat tat. Exactly, but that's the point. Yeah. Exactly, one hundred and ten percent. I want to be a curator in that space that is creating content that is even better than what's already there. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of Taylor Swift in the world, but I'm I admire the exists. brand. I admire. I'm glad she exists and she's committed yeah. to Nashville yeah. and te- and Tennessee as as well, yeah. and has gotten involved in politics. Yeah. They're they're building the new um, history of African American music museum in Nashville, okay. which will be right downtown awesome. off of Broadway. Awesome. So guess what? They're going to have a high influx of African Americans. They're going to want to go to that museum. Yep. A lot of other kinds of people are going to want to go to that mm-hmm. museum. Mm-hmm. Lizzo just played at the Ryman a couple of months ago wow. as well. So yeah, so things are changing. Yeah. Things are evolving and there is an energy that's there that just frankly does not exist in Atlanta. Atlanta is too siloed with all of its points of light and mm-hmm. so-called opportunities. I mean, I have no chance of getting on the Tyler Perry lot, nor do you right. or nor does pretty much anybody else that is not in his loop. Yeah. That's yeah. how he runs his company. That's how he runs his business. He's not developing back into Atlanta. And that's his choice. Sure. That's his sure. call. That's his that's his that's his thing. You know, if he called me, would I pick up the phone? Absolutely. But the point is is that he's probably not gonna call. Yeah. And by the time by the time he would call, I wouldn't need him. So he, he's kind of like everybody else in the system. He's like a chunk of LA that is just dropped right. that's in Atlanta. A good way to think and, of it. And, you know, Atlanta is really committed to uh, financing family films, Christian films, right. things like that. Nashville is more committed to being on the edge. Mm-hmm, Na- mm-hmm. Nashville seems to be more open to great ideas, great concepts, you know, integrated content, media, corporate sponsorship from all different directions. You know, Nashville has no shame to their game. They're w- willing to get in there and get down with anybody that they think or they know has talent. Yeah. And it is a more merit-based market. Yeah. You've got to have something going on. So Billy Ray saw something in Lil Nas yeah. X. Yeah. You know, that he felt like, okay, this guy's got it together. Yeah. This is worth, yeah. this is worth my time. You know, well, well, yeah, my and actually, guest number two is my friend Stuart Carraris, who was who helped engineer that um, Billy's last time. They're good friends, and so I mean, I was using it. I mean, I think well, my point was obviously tongue in cheek, but right. I mean, massive talent, and he's apparently a great guy. But he, but Billy Ray is apparently. I mean, he's that's an example of how forward thinking he is. He's a super super crafty business guy. Who's also wide open in terms of his interests and tastes. He, he right. his artistry fits in a certain bucket, but his interests are way bigger than the Billy Ray Cyrus that people think they know. Right, you know? perceive him to to be, yeah. and you know he did raise a very talented daughter. Yeah, exactly. As well, and then also so, Miley. I'm just kidding. That was that was a cheap yeah. shot. I just had to. <laughs> no, no, she she is very talented. I would those. She's not going anywhere anytime. No, she's soon, not. That, so. that was yeah. Well, yeah. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> I just had to. I just had to try to make you laugh. That's all. No, that was that completely and totally made made me laugh. That's actually that's really that's really funny. Well, so with um, Nashville, but- yeah, I mean, you we were talking a little, you know, again privately that about Nashville, as great as it is for professional reasons. I mean, we have the two lives: the personal, the personal, and the professional. So, how do you how do you see yourself? existing in the ether are you basically living in airport lounges and and highway you know interstate <laughs> interstate lanes uh continuing to do that i mean how how do you reconcile the whole of your being rel- relative to nashville atlanta california it's um it's the it's the trifecta it's the great triangle as well um, Nashville is to Atlanta what Las Vegas is to LA. Mm-hmm. So it's just a car ride away. Right. Um, I've got great connections halfway between Atlanta and uh, Nashville, and that's in Chattanooga. Oh, yeah. That, that's, well. a, that's, a, that's a cool little city. I, uh, absolutely. And beautiful area. Unbelievable. And then I've got a great company here with great people. I've got great friends here. Um, I have parents that are still here as well, but they have to let me in. They can't. <laughs> they, they can't leave me on the doorstep. Um, sitting in my then, sitting in my mom's sewing room, converted exa- to have the guest exa- bed behind me. Uh, I can understand. Exa- yes, exactly. And that's a part of who we are. And our our families are a tremendous support system for us as we continue down this nonconformist journey that we've been on for decades. Um, and then I've got great, great relationships in LA, people that I've built over the past several years yeah. um, that are there for me, that cheer for me, support me, and once again, are like family. Yeah. And as far as Nashville is concerned, I'm going to get a place, I've already gotten it, and it's right down adjacent to Music Row. I can oh, walk over beautiful. to Music Row. Wow. And so well, you'll, you'll, you'll going... see a lot of great music. You'll hear a lot of great music and see it live, and you'll get to eat a lot of good food. I know that, at least. A- exactly. And I will get to pitch a lot of record labels mm-hmm. on music content. And there are other great institutions that are there as well to be able to go after in this world of exploding content. And Nashville is at the perfect crossroads for that. They're looking for the content. They want the content. And now they need the content providers. And I walk into Nashville with a tremendous amount of gravitas being from L.A. and Atlanta. Exactly. Well, this has been a really fun and interesting conversation, to say the least. Uh, I'm glad we could catch up like this. Um, Do you have kind of any closing thoughts? I kind of opened it up with my... uh, you know, kicking off 2020 with so many new <laughs> things. What what what's your take on on 2020 now that we're in it in it a minute? Well, the funny part about it is is that uh, we will be in a very different place at the end of 2020. Yep. Um. So whatever we're thinking now, it won't be this later. Mm-hmm. Um. Everything is moving and shaking around us. Um. But. For someone like yourself and someone like myself, we have created a layer of Teflon against all of this sort of systemic and distracting discourse. So for me, 2020 is going to be amazing. For a lot of other people, it's going to be a very difficult battle. Yeah. And they're they're going to feel like they're going uphill quite a bit. And there are a lot of people right now that think things are going to work out for them in 2020 and they're going to come crashing to the ground. And it's because they're not working in consortiums and strategic partnerships. And what we do together is what 2020 is all about. Like we empower each other. Yeah. And we get a lot more done. And this whole idea of individualism and siloing yourself into communities that revolve around a base yeah. that is uh, tone deaf to anybody else's needs or issues or Mm -hmm. this idea of I I only get have my uh, information from one news source, you know, like all of this stuff is nuts or this sort of preservation of my own race or this idea that people can't choose their own happiness as far Mm -hmm. as who they love, who they marry. Um, Women can't control their own bodies. You know, these Black guy bleeps of sons of whatever um, have to play in the NFL, mm. you know. Yeah. 
it's it's all going to come to a crashing halt. We are going to turn a massive corner. We will not be the same country in a year. We will not be the same race of humans in a year. And we're going to go to higher ground and some of us will get there and some of us um, won't. And, you know, for you and I, if you make your film in New Zealand and it only sells in New Zealand and Asia and Europe and Africa, you'll be a rich man. Well, oh, well, from from your lips to God's ears, sir. Well, we will have to, besides us staying in touch, we're going to have to do a follow up. And I I think that a a good date for a a follow up recording is probably November 9th. (laughs) <laughs> Agreed. November I think 9th. that might be a yes. good day for us to, yes. to get on the mics and yeah. uh, catch up again and see right. what has so been we should play. Absolutely. We should make it funny and play back some of these things that we said now. <laughs> and see, see how smart we, see are we are now, huh? Oh, you exactly. entertainment guys think you're hot stuff? Okay. Well, no, I don't really. I just, this, exactly. I, this is the story I tell myself to wake up every morning, so. No, we'll, um, we'll both we'll both be in really great places uh, coming November 9th Well, as, as well. Well, I will. Uh, I'll let you get your beachhead established before I carpet bag my way to Nashville. But I do plan to come knocking on your door and see and we'll you see what creative you, trouble you, we can get in together once uh, once you're there. That that sounds amazing. Awesome. You got it. Thanks so much, Fred. All right, brother. You take care of yourself. All right. Well, I hope that delivered as promised up top. This was a lot of fun and. I think it's really important to note that, I mean, we sort of said as much as we went along that, you know, we're not full of ourselves or writing our own hype so much as coming from a really specific point of view that is what has enabled us to keep on forging ahead in these wacky careers in the business of show, as they say. And I hope it's obvious that we don't take anything for granted I hope that you enjoyed this show. Don't forget you can reach out and find me. There's a contact form on my website, crazyinagoodway.com, if you want to find me that way. Check out the socials. Please like and share and subscribe to the show. It means a lot. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week on If I Knew You Better. Mm-hmm.